that. Today we're conducting an interview with Dr. Wiley Barker at his home in the suburbs of Los Angeles. This interview is being conducted on President's Day 2012 as part of a series of interviewing some of the giants or greats in the history of vascular surgery. A committee of the Society for Vascular Surgery, headed by Dr. James Yao, and assisted by Roger Gregory and Norman Rich, as well as a number of other younger interviewers, is conducting interviews of some of the giants in our field. This project is sponsored and supported by the Society of Vascular Surgery and will be available on the vascular web of the SVS. Our interviewee today is Dr. Wiley Barker. Dr. Barker was born in Santa Fe, New Mexico and was raised there. He then moved to Boston for both his undergraduate degree at Harvard as well as Harvard Medical School. Following his, his medical school training, he then went to the Brigham and Women's Hospital, or at that time the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, for his residency training in surgery. He took time, time off to serve in the military and then returned for 18 months to his residency at Peter Bent ben Brigham Hospital be, before moving to Los Angeles. He spent his entire career at the UCLA Medical Center and helped build the Department of Surgery with another famous surgeon, Dr. William Longmire. Dr. Barker is now retired, lives in the suburbs of LA, and today we're going to ask him questions about his life and career as a vascular surgeon. Dr. Barker, the first question is about the transition between Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Boston, where you went to college. What was it like living and growing up in Santa Fe? Santa Fe was a delightful place in these, those days. I was in the first class from Santa Fe High School that had more than 100 students in it, to give you an idea of the size of the place. I've seen pictures of you on horseback riding. Were you raised on a ranch, or was that no. what everybody did in Santa Fe? My grandfather had settled on this ranch in 1888 and had reared his 13 children there. And we often therefore visited the ranch, which is 100 miles from Santa Fe, as you have to drive, but about 35 miles by crow. We didn't have a crow. I did some writing there. It was nothing very exciting. Nancy and I later made these trail rides, which were roughly 10-day rides in which we'd cover perhaps 120, 130 miles in the course of 10 days in the wonderful spots in the West that are designated as isolated Wilderness areas, areas that are withdrawn from public use. They are for recreation only. Uh -huh. you, there's no roads. You go by foot or by horse. Tell, tell us a little bit about your family, why your parents uh, lived, did, what their careers were, and whether you had brothers or sisters. My dad uh, was 11 years old when the family moved from Texas to Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, he was first interested in mining, but after a cave-in in the mine in which he went out the right way and was saved, my mother said very firmly, and she had a small Irish voice, but she spoke firmly. She said, Charles, you're never going underground again. So Dad ceased to be a gold miner and took up the law, passed the bar, and practiced for 50 years thereafter in Santa Fe. Did they have a connection to Harvard, or how did no. you get an interest in why would you move to the East Coast? I was expecting to go to the University of New Mexico, and there was an unfortunate accident in which the senator from New Mexico, whom we knew well, was the second vice uh, chairman in the vestry of the Santa Fe Church, the Church of the Holy Faith. 
Dad was the senior warden in that church. Unfortunately, Senator Cutting died in an air accident. His fam Cutting's family gave an immense amount of money to establish the so-called national scholarships for boys west of the Mississippi. It wasn't predicated on the need. You could have a Harvard cutting scholarship and pay a dollar a year, or you could take your whole funds. It give you a shock. My four years at Harvard College cost $4,100. That's four years, food, room, all fees, and a few pennies left over. Was it a big adjustment for you going from Santa Fe to Boston and to Harvard College? Not as big as you would have thought, partly because I wound up rooming with a boy I'd been close friends with since second grade. And, uh, but I think the Harvard people sometimes used to look at me and wonder what this was from the West Coast. You inter interrupted your residency for military service. Tell us about serving in the military and what impact that had on your career. Well, let me start by saying on the day after Pearl Harbor, we all rushed down to try and enlist. After about the fifth of us turned up at the same clothes and attitude and so on, the chief petty officer came in and said, what are you guys doing? Are you in medical school? And we said, yes, sir, not knowing any better. And he said, well, get your tails back to home. We'll call you. <laughs> and they did. I, I, I was called after 18 months in the, in the residency the first time around. And I understand that during your time in the military that you were on a naval ship and it was incredibly busy as far as the amount the, of surgery that you did. About half of the time I was on in hospitals. First I started out in the hospital in Boston and after about four or five months there I found a note that I was to expect my orders to the Grand Canyon. The proper orders came through. They meant the Grand Canyon, USS Grand Canyon, and not the canyon in Arizona. And I wound up in Italy for seven months, I think. I got back to the States, and the surgeon at the Norfolk Naval Hospital discovered there was somebody with a little surgical training sitting in the ship out in the bay, and I got transferred to the Norfolk Hospital where I did a, just an unbelievable amount of surgery. I was a ward officer, and I was also in charge of 100, ward, 100 beds of rectal and pilonidal surgery. Did you have any particular or great mentors doing either medical school or residency that impacted your, your professional and particularly your surgical career? Well, there were several. Jim Blodgett was a resident when I first started my program. He was a wonderful, very effective, very skillful teacher. John Homans was recalled from retirement to serve as a mentor to us, and I got along with John very well. I was interested in blood vessels. I'm not sure, I haven't been able to identify why I got interested in blood vessels. But John Homans certainly fanned that interest. Did you know John Homans? Yes, yes, he was our ward surgeon. And tell us a little bit about his contributions. I know most uh, physicians know about Homans' sign. Is that named after him? It's and are there other things that he did? It's named after him. He wrote one of the first books on the surgery of the vessels, blood vessels, which I do not have a copy. I, they're in libraries someplace and unavailable. Maybe try eBay. Yeah, <laughs> I, true. Uh, he introduced me, though, to the concept of 
deep venous thrombosis that should be treated by uh, interruption of the vein. Now you started your career as a general surgeon as well as a vascular surgeon and as I understand it gradually evolved to being almost exclusively vascular. How, when did you discover vascular as a potential complete career for you? I never did. I hate to say this in public, but I am not a certified vascular surgeon. The reason I'm not is when the first selections were being made, I was asked how many carotids I'd done in the last year. At that point, I was about to retire or slow down at the Veterans Hospital in the Valley. And in the last year, I hadn't done more than 30 or 40 carotids. And the level at that point was 50 in one year. I hadn't done that many, and, that many, and I was not accepted as a board member in vascular surgery. I understand, though, a number of the people who founded our specialty never became what we would call the now board certified. So you're, I'm, you're still in a select group. I'm even in that you, group. <laughs> when you uh, moved to, to UCLA, uh, as I understand it, Bill Longmire founded the Department of Surgery, and you were one of the first professors that he recruited. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a founding member of a department and what the challenges are that might be different from those of us who walk into an existing job within a department. Even more than the settled job of an established surgeon, you just never knew what was going to happen. I, for instance, just to make it seem odd, I did my first the first private operation I did was a hysterectomy. And the last private operation I did was a hysterectomy on an opera singer who was to do her last performance in six weeks. I was a little nervous doing a hysterectomy, but the person who was most nervous was the man who was slipping that tube through her vocal cords. She made it. And she sang well, I assume. She sang well. Good. One of the other uh, very notable surgeons at UCLA in vascular at the time uh, was a surgeon named Jack Cannon. Uh, I know you wrote about and developed some devices with him. Tell us about Jack and what your relationship was to him. I had known Jack in medical school. He was younger than I, but he was a year ahead of me in medical school. And when Jack arrived, he was to work primarily in the laboratory with Bill Longmire, where he did some of the pioneer work in, in uh, transplantation biology. But uh, Jack clinically, well, there was yet a little sensitive point. Near the end of my training, required training period, Bill Longmire came in one day and said, Wally, we're going to alter your plan for the future. And I said, oh my God, they're going to fire me again and send me west. And he said, I'd like to have you cease your residency here. That is, cease your relationship to the VA as a resident, but stay on as the director or chief of the surgical service at UCLA, which was a kind of a shock. He was to stay as professor of, vas of general surgery, and I was to be chairman of vascular surgery and the general surgical division. He then was to supervise the other divisions of surgery, otolaryngology, and all those things. So like many, would you consider Bill Longmire to be one of your mentors? And he was, absolutely. I was the first person to whom he promised a job. That was before I went abroad. When we headed west, I still hadn't finished my residency. I'd been off in the Navy in Italy. And I, we headed west, I became very quickly chief of the general surgery service, as I mentioned. 
you had contact with a large number of people who were founding members of our field of vascular surgery. Tell me who among your contemporaries impressed you, where they were from, and what, what impressed you about them, and what contributions did One they make? One person whom I think we've generally forgotten is uh, Oscar Creech from New Orleans, who was a protege of uh, Oxner. And I got to know Dr. Oxner very well. Were there others like uh, commonly known names would be DeBakey, Cooley, oh, sure. uh, DeBakey, Stanley Crawford in, in the Houston area? Were they well, people that you Stanley knew well? Stanley Crawford had been a surgical student of mine in medical school. And he grew up rapidly under Dr. DeBakey and certainly became one of the outstanding people in vascular surgery. Were there any Despite more? His accent. Were there any more that you remember that particularly that you had a great impact on you? Some of the pioneers in our field. Well, Oxner, Alton Oxner did. John Holmans, as I say, but he retired before I really got into my proper role in, at UCLA and at, um, at UCLA. Now you mentioned that board certification was something that you never achieved because of the, the volume requirements. But I'm curious as to whether you thought the idea of board certification was a good one, whether you supported it? I do support it, did support it, and do support it. I do think that uh, it ought to maintain some relationship to the American Board of Surgery. But I don't think there should be a paternal kind of a relationship with the board. I think they ought to be more or less on an equal but uh, cooperative role. During your career also, or maybe after you'd retired, but certainly within your lifetime, two of the major vascular societies merged, which was a very politically controversial thing, and which has, I think, turned out well for our specialty. What was your feeling about the Society for Vascular Surgery and the International Cardiovascular Society merging? Uh, their two meetings and their leadership and getting together as an or one organization. It seemed to me that that dual situation with two societies, in many ways re trying to repeat each other's work, I, th I had, didn't think that was good. And so I thought that the formation as president of the Society for Vascular Surgery and two levels of membership works out very well. I do think that there is a role for the academic surgeon and a role for the practicing surgeon. I don't think it was that clear at the time that it happened. I don't think it was that clear to everybody that there were going to be a lot of vascular surgeons in the communities, and there are. The Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery actually, as I understand it, grew out of several private practice vascular surgeons who were connected to UCLA, and that's continued to be a, a successful society. What's your feeling about societies like the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery? Do they still have a role today? What, yes, I think it, they do have a role today. I think that the original establishment of that society was at a meeting with Pete Samuels and a couple of other community surgeons. And we felt that this should be a society for the community surgeon who was trained but wasn't necessarily an academic surgeon. And as that, I turned down the, first, the opportunity to be the first president of that society. I have maintained a membership in it, but I have refused to be an officer as I thought the uh, university type people should not be. They should, I thought, participate, but should not be successive presidents and so on. That's turned around there. The presidents come from the academic world as a rule today. As you know, the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery still continues to be 
very active and yeah. affects probably larger society yes. than when it was founded, so it is thriving. Yeah. yeah. You've been recognized as being a supporter and also an outstanding teacher, and actually there's a, a teaching award given to residents named after you, as well as an endowed chair, which I'm honored to hold. Uh, tell us a little bit about your interest in teaching, where it came from, and what you see as the role of teaching in surgery. Well, it may be uh, almost congenital. My father taught briefly. My sisters and my brother were teachers at one time or another. My aunts and uncles were almost all teachers. So it's kind of a family thing. One question that everyone involved in our committee wanted us to ask you is about your treatment of one of the most famous people in not only the United States but the world, Richard Nixon, when he developed deep vein thrombosis. Could you take us through how you got involved in that? Maybe why he didn't go to either the Naval Hospital or Walter Reed and, and some of the aspects of, of consulting on the President of the United States and recommending treatment. Mr. Dixon would not have been really at home at Walter Reed, and he had moved to the West Coast already. His physician, when he found that he had a swollen leg, wanted me to take over the surgical care. I was scheduled to spend two weeks as a visiting professor in Hawaii. And I resisted because I didn't want that continuing care. I said, I'll be glad to see him, but not as a continuing doctor-patient relationship. So I went to see him and spent three hours talking with him. Did you go to his home or did he come to you? He was in a hospital in um, the South Bay area. I must say, I'm not a fan of Mr. Nixon, but he was gracious, polite, and very much interested and demonstrated considerable understanding of his disease. I was surprised at that. And tell us, tell us what he had and well, what your recommended treatment was for it. He turned up after a flight to Japan, I believe, with a small venous thrombosis, which he was treating with, I, I think it was no more than aspirin. Several weeks later, his leg became more swollen, and they did a very careful flebogram on both legs. The left leg was absolutely normal. He couldn't identify any thrombosis anywhere in it, nor symptoms. His right leg was not significantly swollen, but there was a loose clot waving in his femoral artery. You could see it from one picture to another, change position in the dilated femoral artery. Femoral was it in vein. the femoral artery? Yeah, in femoral the femoral vein. vein. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I recommended bilateral iliac vein interruption. He said, if the left leg is normal, why treat it? And I had to think that one over, and I agreed that he had a point. So I yielded on that and arranged for one of my former residents to do the operation. They didn't do it quite as I had wanted. I was on a plane to her for Hawaii at the time. When I left, I called the hospital to find out how he was, and he was doing just fine. I got off the plane in Honolulu, and but with headlines that said, Mr. Nixon bleeding to death. <laughs> he had uh, had a little post-operative ooze, and the internists who got excited about this pumped him full of liquid, which put his hematocrit down, and they overestimated his blood loss. They called for help from Don Mulder, and Don Mulder says, for heaven's sakes, leave him alone and let him equilibrate. And he did, uh, they did, and he did. So it was a dilutional anemia that he had that led to the press release that he yes. was bleeding rather yeah. than real yeah. blood loss. It makes you wonder exactly what you can believe in the newspapers. <laughs> At the time, I believe that vena cable filters either were being or had just been discovered 
Uh, and nowadays, that's probably the way he would have been treated with a filter and, and anticoagulation or thrombolysis. Was there a consideration to using a vena cable filter, or was that not no. available at the time? It was available, perhaps, for a few people, but we were not used to using it yet. And uh, as it turned out, the ligation was very successful. He had no further trouble with, with his lung. And his leg was substantially asymptomatic. Did you keep contact with President Nixon, or did he? Did you? He ever thank you after you, uh, after you came back from Hawaii, and after he recovered? Well, this was a sensitive point. He, I, he was a little unhappy that I left for Hawaii, but the surgeon who did the care was a wonderful man, and he got along well with him. Did you bill him for the procedure, or how did you handle I, that with the President of the United States? He wasn't President. He was then. Past President. Past President, sorry. Uh, I considered not billing him, and considered it for a long time. But uh, some of my senior advisors said, of course, he expects it. And so I gave him, sent him a generous bill, which was promptly paid. In looking over your background, it's, you did a number of procedures and wrote a lot with Jack Cannon, whom you mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the devices that is still occasionally used today uh, is a, an endoarterial stripper that's used for removing plaque in the femoral and iliac artery with a semi-closed technique. Tell us a little bit about how you thought of developing that and whether you saw that as the beginning of the endovascular era. After a day doing an open endarterectomy in the, in the femoral artery, this is a long, tedious operation. The first ones I did, I did the entire femoral artery open, and that becomes a tedious repair. And Jack and I were sitting in the office talking about this and figured there ought to be some better way to do this. And he wanted to make an instrument that you could pass, and I wanted to make an instrument that would plow ahead, so to speak. It wasn't a very good idea. Jack was much better. We designed loops. I went home and bought some piano wire, and I had trying to find the one that I have left. Bought some piano wire, heated and dis distempered, if you will, about three inches of the end, made a loop out of it that was a loop that sort of leaned forward. I flattened that leading edge a little bit, so it was not quite cutting, but it was a little less than blunt. And I used those all my career until Jimmy Yao borrowed them for a display. They disappeared from the display and never been heard from since. I have one left, but I'm not operating. It's in my desk drawer. Do you see that as the beginning of the endovascular era of rather than opening up an artery yes. to, from a distance, yes. doing a, a yes. procedure yes. from the inside? Yes. What, what was your favorite operation during your career? Was there one that you particularly liked doing? Gallbladder. Vascular surgeon doing gallbladder. I was a general surgeon. Was it because it was easy or no, low stress I, or, or you just got satisfaction? Yes. It was easy, very little stress. And it was kind of fun to do. Did you ever consider doing a laparoscopic gallbladder like is done now routinely? That was before the era of the laparoscopic procedures. Yes, I think that is a, a great operation if you're skilled enough to do it right. You've been known as a historian. I think when I first met you, you were uh, the historian for one of the vascular societies. Uh, how did you get your interest in history, and have you written about history? I was interested in history in general, 
and having known people like Holmans and Cutler and some of the other great general surgeons and neurosurgeons, uh, I just kind of fell into it. You've written several books, I know, not only on history, but on, I think, the first of the arterial surgery textbooks. How did you decide to write that when none had been written before you, you embarked I on your project? I decided to ask, write it after I was asked to do so by the editors of the series. Did it sell well? Yes, I wrote a, I thought, a darn nice book on general vascular surgery. Turned out that it sold out immediately, and then it appeared further that the editor had only printed 100 copies. I could have sold 500. And by that time, he was off in New Orleans doing something else and wasn't interested in continuing the series and would not yield the plates and stuff to me. It was one that was too little to be bothered about. But it was a good book, I thought. I had a copy, but I couldn't find it this morning. But you haven't seen my office. <laughs> <laughs> what would you consider to be the greatest contribution that you've made to the field of surgery, and particularly to vascular surgery? I think the concept of endovascular surgery without opening the whole artery. I'm not sure that, I guess that, that leads directly to endovascular surgery through a very small port. We were able, however, with our stripper to make an incision at the knee and then the groin and remove a great long femoral intima without any trouble. So I, I think it was the beginning of endovascular surgery. All of us experience failure during our career, and hopefully uh, we learn from it. Yes. Did you have any uh, areas of failure or mistakes that you feel like you made and that might have helped you in developing differently as a, as a surgeon? Undoubtedly, but I think I tend to remember not to remember those. I really can't think of any things that I would have done differently. You stayed for your entire career at UCLA. Yes. Your first job was at UCLA, and we're talking now in a house in a suburb where you've retired. Why did you spend your whole career at UCLA? Did you consider moving to a place and becoming a chief of surgery, or just experience another place, or going back to New Mexico? I was considered for several jobs, including one first job. I was in Albuquerque. The committee that was organizing the medical school in the first place asked me if I wanted to be dean. I shuddered and said no. A year or two later, the man who had been chosen as dean was the son of the man who did the first appendectomy. I can't think of his name, but the man who had been chosen to be dean asked me to be chief of surgery. And Nancy and I considered it seriously. And I was wavering when the last afternoon we went out to the VA in Albuquerque. It was dreadfully hot and miserable. We started home, and we were in a dust storm as we left the hospital. And a mile later, we were in a cloudburst. We got to the dean's house, and the wind blew Nancy's wig off. And she said, all right, that, that answers it. You can come to, to Albuquerque if you wish, but I'm not coming with you. <laughs> she knew that I wasn't really serious. Did Sterling Edwards take that job? Was he a friend of yours? And uh, He was a long-time friend, yes. And did he take the job when you didn't take it? Yes. Uh -huh. When you lived in Brentwood, close to UCLA, and also out here, I understand that you developed a passion for growing orchids, and you probably had some other interests. But tell us how your interest in orchids developed and and whether or not that became almost like a business for you after you finished uh, with 
your, well, your time at UCLA? Well, it was because we sold plants and we wrote a book, which we sold and we still sell, an e-book. How did I get interested is, I think, intriguing. I was working in the Harvard labs as a student working on a thesis. The man working across the hall from me was one of the great orchid growers. And I was interested in what he was doing, and he gave me tickets to several orchid shows. Now this was before the war. After the war, back in Boston, I had no chance to grow orchids, but when I got out here, first thing I knew, I was there was an orchid greenhouse down the street a few blocks selling plants, and I bought a plant, and before I was through, I had about 1,500 plants. And we sold plants, and we sold flowers. Are there orchids named after the Barker family? No. No? No. There's, a, there's one named after the, after the Barkers, but it was a different Barker. Are there any other interests that you've had since retirement? One interest we did have, point out, my grandfather was, uh, lived in the mountains, a mountain ranch near Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, we went on several trail rides. My dad's 91st birthday, my uncle Omar and Elliot were there. Elliot was head of the game and fish department, and he had been leading these trail rides through the mountains of New Mexico and elsewhere. And he arrived late, and he apologized to me because he said, I, I really should have been here for your father, but this, this is my last trail ride at 81. And I thought I ought to finish it. And I said, oh, gee, this is where I made my mistake. Gee, Uncle, Nancy and I always wanted to go on one of these rides with you. He said, all right, we'll go again next fall. So we went on the first ride in the New Mexico wilderness, 10 days on a horse, with everything carried with you for 10 days. No exposure, no exposure to the outside world. That was fun. So next year we went on another one, and we wound up on seven rides, mostly in, in Wyoming. Dr. Barker, you, I mentioned to you that this is, you're living in horse country, but you mentioned to me that you didn't move here because of the horses. Why did you move to this very rural part of California? Because my daughter lived here. In the, down the street a few miles. And uh, she, she was a single mother, and we wanted to be near her. From here to UCLA is quite a haul. And so we happily found this place and are well settled. Several times you visited UCLA and used to co come to conferences uh, into your mid to late 80s. That's quite a drive. Did you uh, enjoy driving back and seeing old friends, or why I did you, because uh, you, you're quite a distance now? I very much driving back and seeing old friends. Denny Baker and a friend, especially as somebody who is my protege. Denny is just retired. This suited our needs. We, I was really not able to keep up with the all the devices that have come into vascular surgery without doing. You sit in the sidelines and listen to these names and you don't really understand them. It was fruitless for me. As a mentor to many people, what would be your advice to those who come up through the profession? What would you advise a budding medical student or undergraduate or young resident about the field of vascular surgery? and? how to develop a career that's been as successful as yours has been. I think they should pursue their general surgical training to a certain degree. For instance, I looked, I think, one of our younger fellows had a, his CV out for me, and he had 56 papers, 
all on peripheral vascular disease. If you've seen my CV, it's all over the world. And this is partly because Bill Longyear did this to me. While I was a resident, he said one day, they're having a terrible time taking care of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Would you kind of take over and honcho getting them back and getting the surgery done right? Fine. Next thing I knew, Bill said, we ought to study this possibility of ultraviolet light on wound infection. That was a dead end, but it was a lot of work and it had a positive answer negatively. And one day, he came to me and said, you want to drive out to Sepulveda this afternoon and look at the hospital. I'm considering whether we should try and make that a university hospital. And so I did, and the first thing I knew, he then said, I want to appoint you member of the Dean's Committee. When I went to my first meeting, I found I'd also been elected chairman of the Dean's Committee. And a little bit later, Bill suggested that they needed a director of the, for the hospital, and uh, you're it. So Bill guided my career to the very end. He and I were very close. So it sounds like your advice would be to be broadly trained, even though you're going to go into some specialized area like vascular you surgery. You said it so much better than I did. What, what do you see as the, the major challenges to the field of vascular surgery going forward? Are there any particular things that you think are potential pitfalls for vascular well, surgery as a field? I'm not close enough to the field to make a wise answer to that, but it seems to me that not being seduced by devices, but being aware of the disease and applying the devices as necessary, that should be the line of thinking in the training. So possibly that you'd be a vascular disease specialist rather than a, an endovascular surgeon or an open surgeon, which is more focusing on the technology? You could be that too, but you ought to be aware of the general processes of disease in vascular disease surgery. Are there any other things that we should know about Wiley Barker and his distinguished career in vascular surgery? Not really. I've been very fortunate in having things happen and fall my way. Coming out here with Bill Longmire. I thought I was coming back to work at, at UCLA. My program had been outlined. I would spend a year in general surgery, and then a year in the laboratory, and then finish up with the last two years in general surgery at, as top resident at Harvard. Friend Franny Moore took over. He changed that plan and he wanted me to spend several years learning to be a biochemist, then come back and start my clinical training all over again. So that I would have been through my training about the time I was 20 years out of medical school. That did not suit me. I went down to talk to the dean, whom I knew well, and he penciled a handwritten hand note on the back of a letter to John Lawrence, the chairman of medicine at that point. John said, I just learned that uh, Bill Longmire has been chosen as professor of surgery. Let me write a note for him. He took a formal letter that he was writing to Bill and scribbled a few words on him. Bill called me back and said, I want to meet you in the bar of the Drake Hotel tomorrow at seven o'clock. Nancy and I scrabbled together pennies and I flew out, met Bill, and he promised me a position. He didn't say what it would be because he didn't know what he had. And that's how I got in with Bill. I believe that over the entry to Harvard Medical School is a sign that says chance favors the prepared mind. 
In your case, it may be chance favor or favors the prepared person. You've had a very distinguished career, and I'd like to thank you for sharing both your professional and your personal life with us today through this interview. I thank you for thanking me.